Fall of 1946, communist led guerrilla bands. The very partisans who had spearheaded the great national resistance movement against Nazi occupation in Greece, those communist-led bands now took to the hills again. And in almost three years, they struggled under the banner of what was called the Greek Democratic Army to try with a certain grim desperation to recover and restore at least a little bit of that revolution in the making which British imperialism and their Greek ballet had so um, unceremoniously stopped in its tracks. And after three years, at the very end, when that civil war was over, Britain relinquished her primacy in Greece, and the authority of the United States replaced it. And the Greek people, who had sacrificed a half million of their men, women, and children in the great resistance movement against the Nazi occupation, began a very long and unbroken tenancy within an American world order. And so we ask, how did all of that happen? What explains that incredible turn of affairs that is so dramatic not only in terms of the destiny of the Greek people, but in terms of the fortune of American expansionism? What explains that great turn of 1947 and the establishment of the American dominion over Greece? And so we must go back almost two years to those very critical months of December and of January, of December 1944 and January 1945, when British policymakers availed themselves of naked military force in order to try to reimpose their authority over the internal affairs of Greece. That Churchill considered Greece to be, after all, a colony of Great Britain is fairly demonstrable in the very language that he uses. Consider, after all, his instructions as he was to send them to General Scobie, the commander of British forces in Greece, on the 5th of December, right in advance of that military intervention. And Churchill writes to Scobie and says, do not hesitate to fire at any male in Athens who has said British authority or the Greek authority with whom we are now working. Do not hesitate to act as though you were in a conquered city where a local rebellion is in progress. So that the problem really which British policymakers had to resolve was merely the tactical one of how you converted a liberated country into a conquered city. Because you must remember that when the last Nazi troops had withdrawn from Greece or had been driven off the island from that uh, period in late October of 1944, that period was a period of dominion for the National Liberation Front. That when the first British troops arrived in October of 44, Eon controlled four-fifths of Greece and that her army, Elas, now had a standing force of about 75,000 armed partisans. And you mustn't suppose that the authority of Eom in Greece, as it emerged from that liberation, was in any way superficial or imposed. Remember that the National Liberation Front had very broad public support. Remember, after all, that if the communists were the driving force behind Eom, that that liberation front was and remained an authentic coalition of progressive forces in Greece. And remember what is most important in this whole story, that the Greek Communist Party never enunciated or entertained as its goal a proletarian dictatorship in Greece that rather imposed as its goal that very reformist and very legalistic end of establishing a popular democracy. In other words, a protracted transition towards socialism, when the Greek left, supported by the popular classes, would enact that overdue social legislation, would begin to animate a stagnant Greek economy, and what is most important, would begin to purge those state services which had been so honeycombed with fascistic and royalist and collaborationist types after eight years of the Metaxas regime and the Nazi occupation. But you see, a popular democracy, and especially one that threatened to extirpate Greece from her economic stagnation and from her status as a semi-colonial power, had no place in the British scheme of things. 
that from the fall of 1944, Churchill and the British Foreign Office operated upon three intractable and very firm uh, assumptions. One was that a communist Greece, or any variant of it that seemed to be more benign, that a communist Greece could only be a mortal threat uh, to the British Dominion in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, that only the king, and of course a pliant and pro-British ministry, could safeguard England's bastion in Greece. And that consequently, war or no war, that the British had to withdraw troops from those very critical Italian and French fronts and send them into Greece in order to defuse the revolutionary threat of Iam, in order to uh, disarm Elas, and in order to safeguard and restore uh, the monarchy. In short, a counter-revolution in the middle of the war against fascism. And how in the world could Churchill and the Foreign Office possibly carry that off in the midst of a war and against the will of the majority of the Greek people? But don't remember that the policymakers in Great Britain, when they played that Greek game, held very high cards in their hand. We're talking, of course, about the acquiescence of the United States and the Soviet Union. That the United States certainly couldn't fault an anti-communist police action, especially in a country over which they had as yet laid no claim. And that the Soviet Union would do nothing but to disrupt those secret agreements which it had struck with Great Britain and which guaranteed it a free hand in Romania for the very derisive price of simply betraying the Greek Revolution. But we're talking in the second place about the sure support that Great Britain could count upon from the Greek ruling class and all of its hangers-on, who after all were so deeply threatened by the emergence of a burgeoning left-wing mass movement. Now let it not surprise you that the ruling elite so very frequently, after having bellowed patriotism so often, so very frequently will turn to an outside army in order to save its skin. These great denizens of patriotism welcoming the foreign invader. But you see, we have it throughout modern history. Oh, we have that King of France and that French aristocracy in the 1790s uh, welcoming in the armies of Austria and of Russia. Uh, we have, after all, in Russia in 1919, and a Russian aristocracy and bourgeoisie welcoming in interventionist armies. And don't forget that as recently as the popular front period of 1936, uh, the French bourgeoisie was running around saying, Vito Hitler que Bloom, better Hitler than Bloom. And so that Lumpen bourgeoisie of Greece, which after all had linked its fortunes to the British, they are always simply hung on to the coattails of that British army for dear life. But what is less obvious and what must be put in the context of the Greek reality is that those Greek services, the army, the schools, the bureaucracy, the police, were honeycombed with collaborationists, with proto-fascists, with all kinds of types who could only be threatened if there were an authentic Greek revolution, and they had no place to assemble except under the Union Jack. And so the British, when they went in, knew that they could count on the Greek right. In mid-November, after all, they had shuttled from Italy into Greece that so-called Third Mountain Battalion, that armed unit which they themselves had created in Egypt out of the most ultra-royalist and reactionary elements of the Greek army there. Nor did they have the slightest intention, those British policy makers, of dismantling all of those paramilitary fascistic groups which had grown up under the occupation in order to hunt down resistance fighters and to kill them if possible. We're talking, for example, about the security battalions, that Gestapo-like organization which had been created by the puppet government under the Nazis and with their help. Or we're talking about private organizations like the one called X, 
under that General Grivas, which after all was a commando type organization that battened on the pursuit of the militants of Eob during the occupation. All of that was there for the British, but look, if they had depended just upon the support of the outside powers, if they had depended just upon the support of the Greek right, that the British could not have turned the trick, that in the final analysis, British policy makers exploited and profited from that kind of strategic dogmatism and those tactical blunders of a Greek Communist Party, which by all logic should have programmed the defeat of that invasion. Because you see that Greek Communist Party was beholden to the Moscow lie. That after all, it was in the interest of the Soviet Union not to unbalance the grand alliance that Russia had struck with the capitalist West. That consequently it was necessary to contain the revolutionary spontaneity of the mountain battalions under the command of those capitanios. And that in the final analysis, it was necessary for that Communist Party to hew to a legalistic line, <laughs> ignoring those fast-changing circumstances which might have bespoken an armed revolution and the possibility of, a, of its success, betraying, if you please, those lessons of October which Lenin had tried to pass into the world communist movement so that the Greek Communist Party consistently during that war that would break out in December of 1944 underestimated its mass support. That it never called up, for example, armed battalions from the mountains in order to relieve those partisans of Elas who were fighting inside the city of Athens. And worse yet, that it never sought to extend that war beyond the limits of Athens into that countryside where Eom was sovereign. But that instead, it constantly abated its military effort in order to engage in bogus uh, negotiations with the British on the false and self-delusive assumption that they might get a settlement which would enable the communists to operate openly, to build their forces, and to win at elections. All of that, you see, gave the British the respite that they needed. It gave them the much-needed time to build up their military forces in Athens until they became insuperable and until it was impossible. You see, if the Central Committee of the Greek Communist Party had had a Tito to say nothing of a Lenin or a Mao, then Churchill's cards would have crumbled in his hand, but there was none. <laughs> and so the war started on the 5th of December of 1944, when the British policymakers and the, the Papandreou government forced it, because they insisted upon the unilateral disarmament of Elas which meant, after all, that the National Liberation Front would be naked and defenseless against the armed mountain battalions and the security battalions, and consequently would be ground into dust. And so Eom and its leaders bargained, and they said, let us have general disarmament. Let the mountain brigade and the security battalions also disarm, but of course the British didn't want that. On the 2nd of December, Papandreou declared that Elas was dissolved and the war, which would last 36 days until the truce of the 11th of January of 1945 began. And all the while that the battle was raging in Athens, Churchill was busily filling in the details of his scenario for Greece. And so he knew that in the present climate, it was impossible just to bring George II, the king, back. That there would have to be a plebiscite 
in which the people decided that that plebiscite would have to be well managed by a conservative and repressive government. But while there was a wait, while that interim took place, there must be a regency. The monarchy must be preserved under the regency of the Archbishop of Athens, Damiscanos, and consequently hold open the throne. As for the ministry, Churchill and the British Foreign Office fingered that old General Plastiras, because Plastiras still had a little bit of a Republican and a progressive reputation, and because he was tinged with the resistance and the British knew better, they knew that Plastiras had already sent a letter of allegiance to the king, they knew he was viscerally anti-communist, they flew him back into Athens on the 19th of December of 44, set him up in the Grand Bretagne, that hotel which was the center of British operations in Greece, and immediately he made a press conference in which he said that Iam and Ilas had to be destroyed, that the communists were trying to take over Greece. And so the boy was all sent except that, you see, it depended upon a quick military victory by the British over the forces of Elas in Athens, and by the eve of Christmas, the fighting was going badly. At least, after all, Elas was not defeated and had given up little terrain in the city, was confronting everything Scobie could throw at them, tanks and men and firepower. Because, you see, that if Elas was understaffed, if Elas, after all, had poor weapons, what it could do is recruit the people of Athens. And they fought like hell in December. And they fought street by street and house by house to prevent another occupation by a foreign power in their country. And as the war dragged on, criticism began to be mounted in England itself. From the Labour Party especially, now don't get the Labour Party wrong. It is not against imperialism, but it's a bit more thin-skinned than the Conservatives. An outright repression, especially if it isn't swift and not noticed, is consequently something that there is often criticism about. And so embarrassing questions began to be asked in England, and the Labourites began to ask why troops were being denuded from the Italian and the French fronts to fight against Greek partisans who had served the Allies so well by holding down 11 divisions in Greece during the occupation. And so questions began to be asked whether this Elas force simply was composed of communist bandits, as Churchill said, and if so, why it had so much public support. And Churchill was furious, but not derailed. And that man was full of roots. And consequently, he thought, ha, huh, we will have a peace conference, and I will go to Athens myself, pièce de théâtre. It was real cinema, because obviously Churchill had no intention of negotiating real peace. But after all, the stratagem touched all bases. Uh, by going to Athens, after all, he could persuade his public opinion, especially the laborites, uh, that England wasn't out to crush uh, the Eon forces, uh, but simply to negotiate a peace. And then he could have a conference in which he gathered together that whole grab bag of discredited Greek bourgeois politicians who would be sure to outvote uh, the delegates of Eon. And then he would put Eon on the spot. Either they would refuse to go to the conference, and then he could claim to the world that they really wanted to conquer power and wouldn't negotiate, or if they did go to the negotiations, then they would surely be isolated and outvoted. And all the time you see valuable, valuable respite for Scobie, and the military buildup would continue, and Elas would be defeated when the war resumed, and it worked and Churchill baited the trap, and the Greek communists fell into it. Because the Greek communists went to that bogus conference in December of 1944, which opened on the 26th, on the tragically mistaken assumption that Churchill was on the run, 
uh, that he was negotiating for weakness, that he had to respond uh, to the criticisms of the British Labour Party, which were making anti-imperialist noises. And consequently, they were doubly mistaken. A, about the Labour Party and what it was into, and B, about the fact that this piece de théâtre was an authentic peace conference. And so it opened on the 26th under the presidency of Damaskinos as though he were already the head of state. And around the table were all of these bogus politicians of the Greek bourgeoisie. And the Eom delegates came in, headed by Siantos the communist, and they thought they had it in their hand and they asked for everything. And their peace terms would have turned power legally over to the National Liberation Front. Uh, they said they wanted 50% of the seats in a new government, uh, that they wanted important ministries like those of justice and the interior, uh, that they wanted the dismantling and dissolution of the mountain brigade and the security battalions, uh, that they wanted a purge of the police, uh, that they wanted quick elections to decide the fate of the king and to elect a constituent assembly quick before the masses were demobilized. And that was all like tinder into the matchbox of, of Churchill. And it, it created his conflagration of anti-communism. It was all magnificently staged. Plastiras fulminated. Saldiras walked out. And consequently, Churchill hurried and called a press conference of journalists from all around the world and said, we tried. We tried and the communists broke it up. And consequently, there is nothing to be done. They want to take over Greece. Well, that satisfied world opinion, quelled the labor opposition, and behind that smoke screen of propaganda, Churchill went busily at work. And it didn't take much persuasion to get the Greek bourgeois politicians to agree that the Archbishop of Athens should become the regent and that he should hold the throne open for the plebiscite nor that the king, uh, did it take much persuasion for the king to sign the proclamation on the 30th of December, which the foreign office wrote, in which he made Damaskinos of the region. And then the archbishop obeyed orders, and on the 3rd of January, he named General Plastiras as the prime minister, and Churchill was riding high well. For those partisans, they went back to an Athens to fight, in which now the British had far superior firepower, in which they had far superior armor, in which in the interim, Scobie had organized that National Guard, composed of the sons of the rich bourgeois, and composed of all kinds of collaborationist dregs, which after all could fight the urban guerrillas on their own terms well. By the 5th of January, Elos had withdrawn from Athens, and its militants were running for their lives. And on the 12th of January of 1945, the representatives of Eom signed a, a ceasefire on British terms, and the 36-day war ended, and with it, the revolutionary process in Greece that had been set in motion by that great resistance movement against the Nazi occupation. But the question, would the communists of Greece then throw in the sponge would the leaders of that liberation movement then decide that because a city had been lost, the city of Athens, that one was then to deliver Greece into the hands of a reactionary bourgeoisie and a foreign imperialist power? And yet that's exactly the road that the Greek communists walked. For on the 12th of February of 1945, after 10 days of negotiations in the little town of Artiza in Greece, they signed a peace settlement with the British, known as the Barquiza Accord, in which they really delivered the Greek Revolution into the hands of its enemies. Sixteen years later, in 1961, 
At the 8th Party Congress of the Greek Communist Party, the Accord of Orkiza was characterized as an inadmissible compromise. But once again, you see, the party was trimming. It was no compromise at all. It was out and out capitulation. A capitulation which opened the door wide to the deportation and the imprisonment and the execution of scores of thousands of Greek militants whose only sin, and a cardinal sin it was, is that they had taken up the struggle against fascism. <coughs> A capitulation that reveals in the most glaring light the dogmatism of the leadership of the Greek Communist Party and, of course, the catastrophic consequences of Stalinism. Because, you see, that party was Stalinist. In its leadership, certainly. That certainly it believed that, the, uh, that there was an identity uh, between the interests of the Soviet Union and the interests of the Greek Revolution. That certainly these were apparatchiki who had a tremendous suspicion of the Capitanios and of all of those guerrillas in the hills. And certainly they followed the Moscow line of legalism. And that legalism, after all, insisted that if they could only get a general amnesty, if they could only bargain with the British and get an amnesty after the fighting, they would be permitted to operate openly, they would be permitted to recoup their forces and to win at elections what the British had denied them on the field of battle. A grotesque self-deception and a self-deception, after all, which would be catastrophic. Because by the time the communists went to Barquiza, the revolutionary option was by no means dead. Remember that. Remember that if Athens had been lost, 27 of 30 districts in Greece were still under the administration of Eon that Elas, after all, was still in the mountains, in all of those mountain strongholds, and that the Capitanios were jumping at the bit to get into a struggle from which they had been so systematically excluded in that 36-day war, but the communists would have none of it. And the, con the, 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 the center point, or the pivot, of the negotiations at Barquiza was that idea of amnesty for that, after all, the communists would give up what? Their arms? Oh, the British and Pastillas had no interest in bargaining at Barquiza. And so, after all, the sine qua non, even for discussion, was point one of the Barquiza Accord. And that is that the communists agreed that the Liberation Army would give up its weapons. And so within two weeks, the orders went out from the Communist Party itself to all of those Capitanios and all of those Andartes, those bewildered and shattered men, that they were to give up to government agents the weapons that they had wrested in their struggle against Italian and German fascists. And so they gave up 42,000 guns and 2,000 machine guns and 163 mortars and 36 pieces of heavy artillery. And except for those weapons that partisans buried in the ground because they refused to surrender them, the National Liberation Movement stood defenseless before the forces of order. But a compromise for giving up those weapons, then what? What, after all, did the communists get? What they got were compromises so flimsy that they weren't worth the paper they were written on. The legality of the Communist Party and of the EOP. A legality which would be at the sufferance of the government, but neither EOP nor the Communist Party were to be represented in the government. The compromise that there would be elections for a parliament and a plebiscite on the question of the king, but they would not be held for at least a year until such time, after all, as a repressive government could defuse the left, but the amnesty was important, no.
there was no general amnesty. What the British and the Bastiros government granted was a truncated, deformed amnesty which excluded from its terms a whole crowd of so-called crimes before the common law. So that the government and the British had all of the leverage they needed to make trials and arrests of scores of thousands of resistance fighters for crimes committed under the occupation in the struggle against the Nazis. Not surprising then that on the 12th of February of 1945, a very long night of repression descended upon the popular classes of Greece. A veritable orgy of violence, an orgy of hatred and vengeance, which we call the White Terror. And we have seen it before in history, and it comes, you see, when popular movements are crushed. It came in France in 1871, and too did it not after the crushing of the Paris Commune. And it came again in Hungary after the fall of the Bela Kuhn communist regime. You see, it comes whenever the triumphant ruling classes, full of hatred now, return with their hangers on to restore order. And there is nothing like it in history. Nothing like that tremendous sense of hatred of masses of people who have done the unthinkable who have become articulate, who have demonstrated their capacity, and who have even taken up arms. It is always so close to the surface, isn't it, what the Secretary of Agriculture revealed to us so openly. And it is there all the time, and when the movement is crushed, the terror begins. And that white terror in Greece was in part governmental and official. It meant that literally thousands of militants were rounded up and tried under crimes against the common law committed during the occupation. Literally the programming of the imprisonment, the deportation, the execution, certainly the forced unemployment of scores of thousands of Greeks. And along with that, a thoroughgoing purge of the bureaucracy and the state services, just in case anybody had slipped through the net who in any way showed resisted sympathies. But that isn't even the worst. Because you see, these white terrors become private and wildcat. And that's the worst of it. And across Greece in 1945 and 6, without any respite or stop, Roam these uh, right-wing bands, these Nazi-type commandos, hunting down resistance fighters, burning their houses, assassinating them when they could. And all of that wasn't even enough for the British. Came the 7th of April of 1945, and they forced Plastiras out of office because they decided, after all, that he was a little bit too tinged with republicanism and a little bit too tender-hearted about the repression. Didn't want really to purge the officer corps of the army of anybody that had ever had a republican sentiment. And so, on the 7th of April of 1945, he is forced out of office, and Bulgaris, Admiral Bulgaris, comes in as the prime minister, and the British had faith in him. Not only was he an ultra-royalist, but then he was the guy who had so brutally repressed the rebellious and mutinous sailors in April of 1944 in Egypt. And under Bulgaris, that kind of repression really escalated. You see what you are into that is so fantastic. That just shortly after this resistance movement, to have been a Nazi or a Nazi collaborator was like a badge of reliability. To have fought in Elas was suddenly a sin of the most cardinal sort. And consequently, at the leadership levels, at the chief administrative levels in the army and in the bureaucracy and the police, uh, they were those who were pro-Nazis. They were those who had collaborated. They were those who were fascists. And so the repression escalated 
to the point that even the bourgeois politicians in Greece wanted to call something of a halt to it. That memorandum of the 5th of June of 1945, which a bunch of bourgeois politicians, including even Plasilas himself, including Tsardalis, who was the head of the government in exile during the war, send a memo to the prime minister and say, for heaven's sakes, what we're doing is breaking down even the slightest political process in Greece under this terror. In November of 1945, the region, Damiskinos, tried to stop it, and that under British pressure, <clears throat> because the British now are ruled by the Labour Party. That actually has turned out Churchill in the spring elections of 1945, and a little bit too tender-hearted about all this repression in Greece, and also interested in elections. After all, if they wanted a pliant and reactionary ministry, they also wanted one that had the legitimacy of elections, but how in the hell could you hold elections in that reign of terror going on in Greece? And consequently, in November of 1945, Bulgaris is replaced by the region and appointed is a liberal, presumably, who is going to try to end the repression. So fool this, but he is impotent. Because you see, by the turn of 1946, power was where the British really put it. Power was in the army, it was in the police, it was in the roving band of Nazi-type commandos in the country. In that atmosphere, Greece held its first post-war elections. And those elections were held on the 31st of March of 1946. And under the best of circumstances, those elections would have been full of fraud and intimidation. Because after all, there was a terror over the country, and there was repression everywhere. And so that the results ended up in a victory for the monarchist right is not so surprising. The size of that victory is surprising. And it must be attributed to the tactic of the Greek Communist Party. Because the Communist Party and its allied parties in Eom decided, after having opted for legalism, after having given everything up at Varkiza for the legalistic line, decided in March of 1946 to boycott the election. At that very moment that if there was anything needed, it was a voice of the left, the presence of the left, to prevent the course of Greek affairs from degenerating, degenerating further. If there was ever a time it was in March of 46 and the party said no, we will boycott the elections. And you see, you have to understand what's in the head of that central committee. And they had opted for legalism in 1945. And even after the Barquiza Accord was proved to be bankrupt, even in the months following, in 1945, when all of that repression was so apparent, when there wasn't legalism but a nightmare of illegalism, the party clung to its line and said the Marquisa Agreement was right and sound. And that was especially true after April of 1945, when the old and revered Secretary General of the Communist Party returned to Greece. That was Nikos Zachariadis. And Zachariadis came back miraculously alive after three years in Dachau. And came back at the end of April of 1945 and there was a sense of joy that somehow Zachariadis would set right all of the errors of the party, even Aris Velkiotis thought that. That somehow Zachariadis represented the revolution, but no. This was energetic, this was intelligent, this was a brilliant organizer, the Zachariadis, but a Stalinist through and through. Certainly the very model of the orthodox, orthodox communist. And so from the very beginning, Zachariadis said that the legalist line was right, and he imposed that will on the Central Committee. 
So much so that at the Central Committee meeting of the 25th of June of 1945, Nikos Zakharyadis said that the British, after all, as the Russians had insisted, had legitimate claims in Greece and that the communists had to adapt to those claims. What about the fact that all of this repression was going on? And Zaharyana said, but there is legalism. Look, the party exists and is in the open. Look, the paper comes out every day. <laughs> and what about the critics in the party? The ones that really wanted to take to the hill. The ones that already were saying that Farkiza was bankrupt and that the party had sold the movement out of Farkiza. No, no, resume the struggle before it is too late. And Zaharyadat said they were adventurers, that they were destroying the chance of the party to make big gains at the election. No, no. What he did was to program a major purge in the ranks of the Greek Communist Party, and his aim, you know where it was. His aim was especially at that war, whose very existence proved that Aparachiki and the Central Committee don't make revolutions, but that people might. And that was Aris Malutiotis. Now Aris was up in the hills, and he was beginning the fight again. And it is literally true that when he heard that Zahariadis had come back to Greece, he was elated and he thought all would be well done. No. The 10th of June of 1945, at the Central Committee meeting, Zachariadis pushes through a resolution which calls Velukiotis a traitor, an adventurer, a renegade. And goes on to say in language which is peculiarly communist language. His current activities are helping the force of reaction to formulate anti-communist arguments providing them with a pretext to claim that we are breaking the Marquisa Accord, as though it weren't, being broken, it weren't being broken all over the place by the other side. The 12th of June, Glukiotis got word of that attack. Somebody showed him a newspaper <coughs> item in which the attack was printed, crushed, obviously crushed. How would you feel if you had devoted yourself to the party in the hills in that kind of struggle and suddenly were called a traitor and a renegade? The 16th of June, the party went the limit and expelled Aris Malukiotis from the ranks of communism. And they had very little to worry about because that same 16th of June of 1945, Lukiotis and his band of partisans were caught in a governmental military ambush and killed. Whether or not that ambush was there because the government forces had been tipped off by the communists themselves, whether Aris committed suicide or not, or was killed in the fight, we'll never know the answers to that. It suffices to say that the communists were perfectly capable of being intermediary and tipping off the government to get rid of someone they didn't want. What is important, of course, is that Aris's body was then found by the governmental forces, along with the body of Savelos. The Savelos he loved very closely, very dearly, very openly, who died with him. And both of those bodies dragged them to the town of Trikila, and there beheaded, and those heads on display for all to see. Six months later, Zachariadis changed his line. Six months later, by the beginning of 1946, after having endured all of that repression by doing to the line of legalism, he said no, that now there is a chance for a revolution. And suddenly he is getting hepped up over some. One sign is that in Azerbaijan, the pro-communist to that party has established an autonomous republic that the Russians have said they liked it. Then certain communist trade union leaders were running strikes in the major cities of Greece and they were getting mass support. And Zahariadis went on the 12th of February of 46, the first anniversary of Arteza, to the Central Committee and said, we will boycott the elections and we will prepare for a revolution fight. He wasn't thinking of the mountain, nor thinking of those peasant guerrillas against whom there was that kind of visceral hostility, that visceral suspicion, thinking always of that classic urban revolution based upon that tiny Greek proletariat. 
and Marcos Mafiatis was quite right in November of 1948 in a bitter letter to the Central Committee when he said that what the Mariatis was thinking of in 1946 was not a revolution but a push that couldn't possibly have succeeded. But on that ground, the party boycotted the elections and for the right in Greece, it was legalization of their position. What it meant was that in, the, in those elections of the 31st of March, 231 out of 354 seats belonged to the royalist right, and it meant that our old friend Saldaris, the head of that reactionary populist party, is back in Greece as the prime minister, and the repression will escalate. Well, Zahariada still had that idea of that urban revolution, he had it not for very long. He thought, for example, that all was going well in March of 1946 when suddenly the communists were elected to the leadership of the Greek Trade Union Confederation. And it was, it was one of their own, Paparigos, who became the general secretary. But no, the government moved in, the Tsaldaris government, and said there had been irregularities in the election. They ousted all of the communists, put in a gang of thugs of their own, headed by Fotis Makris, who dominated the Greek trade union movement for the next 25 years and devitalized it from A to Z. And more than that, that Zahari Adas thought, well, let the communists go into the army, and there they will form Soviet cells. They will begin to undermine the army and that will help the urban revolution. And instead of sending communists off to the hills to fight, he sent them into the army. Well, you know, in a country, after all, that had been keeping files on every left winger for more than 20 years, every time a communist went down to a conscription center, he was arrested. And some 50,000 were sent to concentration camps between Bartiza and the Civil War that way. The result is, of course, that the right was now in sway, and that all of that effort that had been made in that civil war, nonsense. And consequently, the right consolidated its victory on the 1st of September. The terror was intact. The plebiscite was held. The government claimed that 96% of the Greek people voted in the plebiscite, even though the communists and all the Eon parties were abstaining, and that 69% had voted yes, they wanted George II back. Well, that's good for the British, no? They now have their king, they now have a repressive government. Oh, but you know, the fruits of imperialism, which can be so sweet, sometimes turn sour. And suddenly in 1946 for the British, the fruits of that imperialism turned sour. Granted that they had doused the Greek resistance movement. Granted that they had their king and a pliant ministry. But reactionary Greek governments are expensive. <laughs> and consequently, here are the British bled white in the war. And consequently, with their resources depleted, and how are they going to really subsidize a regime which is corrupt, which doesn't reform the economy, which really lets the economy grind down, which constantly comes for handouts so that the regime can survive? You see, the Greek economy in 1946 was a shambles. In that year, industrial production was 40% of what it had been in 1938. The cost of living was 200% more than it had been in 48, and all of the working class wages remained the same. And consequently, the poor were suffering, the economy was ground down, and yet it was a moment of tremendous enrichment for this parasitical bourgeoisie. Because all of that black marketeering, all of that speculation, all of that kind of influence peddling with the government, look, that in 1945 and 6 there were $350 million worth of food and supply that UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Association, had sent to Greece, and most of that never got to the Greek population, but got into the black market and hence into the pockets of that bourgeoisie. And if they couldn't pay for that lavish bureaucracy and that lavish police, then they ground out more drachmas, and they made more paper money, 
and the inflation became worse, and then they went hat in hand to the British and asked for more money. Well, that's expensive. And by the end of October of 1945, the British, uh, uh, or uh, 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 by the end of October of 45, the British are proposing, after all, that there be some kind of assistance by the United States. The United States gradually begins to interest itself a little bit in Greece, not very much at the beginning. A loan of $25 million <coughs> sent to Greece in January of 1946, because after all, the State Department had the good word of Lincoln McVeigh, who was their ambassador to Greece, who wrote in January of 46, Greece is the only Balkan country attempting to retain orthodox ideas about private property and free enterprise along American lines. Now, it's an interesting description of the American economy that Lincoln McVeigh compared the French economy to it, with all of that open crookedness and all of that open corruption, but maybe he was right. But it suffices to say, at any rate, that the Americans take a little bit of interest by July of 1946, Hugh Dalton, the Chancellor of the Exchequer in England, is telling Taldaris that he doubts that the British can keep their troops in Greece much longer. He doubts, after all, that they're going to be able to loan money much longer and support this Greek government. The Greeks look to the Americans. And finally, in November and December of 1946, Taldaris pays a visit to the United States. He goes to the United Nations and he makes a speech there on the 30th of November in which he says, you know, we are the bastion of democracy. We are fighting against the communist menace. And we are invaded by the North, by Yugoslavia, by Albania, by Bulgaria, which of course is not true. And from there he went on to Washington and saw Secretary of State Burns, and Burns was very sympathetic and said the United States would probably help. But the interesting thing is that the American interest isn't very avid at that point. And on one occasion after another, American policymakers look over toward Greece, rather intrigued by the idea of taking over a British commitment and ousting Britain from that market, but still making conditions, insisting that the Greek government involve itself in some reforms, that it begin to broaden the base of its government a little bit, that it begin to make economic reforms and not be so spendthrift and corrupt. All of that it would, would go over better uh, with the American public, uh, so the Greek politicians uh, were told. By January of 1947, the problem of Greece became more acute. Because on the 6th of January of 47, the British published a report of a parliamentary inquiry commission in Greece, which they had sent out to survey the situation, and which recommended that Britain cease all aid to Greece, that it withdraw its troops, that its money was money down a rat hole, and consequently that it ought to pull out. At the same time, the United States sent an inquiry mission under Paul Porter, and Porter saw much the same thing, much of the same corruption, but by that time, if the British weren't going to be there, the Americans would be. But why? Why? Now you know what you have in Greece. And the American policy makers knew what they had in Greece. They knew that Saldaris, they knew that uh, government was simply corrupt and repressive. They knew that the money being sent was being wasted and falling down into private pockets. And they knew also, which is fundamental, that there was no invasion of Greece by communist forces from the north, and that the democratic army, the resistance movement in the mountains, was weak and was ill-armed and really didn't pose a threat. Look, that that democratic army had been organized on the 28th of October of 1946 by Marcos Vafiadis.
Marcos the Great Capitanios, finally got the approval of the Central Committee when the Tsardaris government began, after all, rounding up communists inside the country. And consequently, the party itself was so threatened it had to go to the mountains. And consequently, a guerrilla resistance movement does begin, but it is small. It is not a crisis. Why the Truman Doctrine? Why the frenzy? Why that tremendous kind of aura of now or never that the free world is on the brink? You have to seek your reasons large. That the Greek problem has to be put into a much larger context than just the question of what's going on in Greece. Oh, for the Greeks, it's a problem of life and death, what kind of a society they will have. But for the Americans, it is something else. It is, first of all, Mediterranean strategy. It is the idea that a show of force in Greece is tremendously important to assert American claims to dominion in the eastern Mediterranean, in the oil-rich Middle East, and that as a link to Asia. That that is very clearly put by the Secretary of Navy at the time, James Forrestal, in his diaries. American power exists and has to be applied to realize its potential rewards. It isn't sufficient to have the largest military establishment in the world. It is no less essential to station it everywhere in the world and use it. In Greece, we can demonstrate our ability to contribute to the reconstruction of the world. What Forrestal is saying is that the power is there. Unless the United States really demonstrates it, and Greece is a perfect place in which it can start, then it cannot really assert its global claims. That if it is claiming the Mediterranean, claiming the Middle East, it has to have its firepower there. And consequently, the Americans begin sending their firepower there. On the 10th of April of 1947, the battleship Missouri puts in at Athens. The 10th of May of 1947, uh, uh, or of, uh, of uh, uh, 47, right. No, 46. Uh, in the midst of 46, uh, all of this shipping begins to be seen in the Piraeus Harbor, and consequently the Americans are already uh, demonstrating their interest in that part of the world. But there's something even more critical, and that is the problem of the American economy. And that is that the American economy had not counted upon European recovery. Or not European recovery, but those bilateral agreements, those kinds of self-help stratagems uh, that European capitalist countries were really resorting to in order to get themselves back on their feet. Look, that American exports into Europe declined from 1946 to 7. And that because so many of these European countries were dollar short and consequently couldn't buy American goods, began to make agreements one with the other. And consequently, a certain kind of dilemma occurred. And that was that once all of that post-war demand really siphoned off in the United States, the United States economy again would fall into repression. And, or, or into recession. And consequently, uh, Truman's economic advisors, already raising kind of a banner of hysteria, insisted that that European market, essential, essential, but how to get it? How, after all, to get it, except not by loans, but by grants except by a subsidy to those exports, except by a program as vast as the Marshall Plan. In other words, to send large sums of money to European countries so that they would be fixed into the relationship with the American market. But how to get a public to accept that? to pay the money for it, how to get a Congress, which had been reluctant to pass the British loan, to accept all of that. In that framework, the Greek crisis is perfect. Because in Greece, after all, you can say that you are defending the free world. In Greece, you can point out that there is a communist menace, which is, after all, immediate, which is present, which is there. In Greece, after all, you can proclaim the global doctrine of intervention to defend freedom. You needed an ideological crusade, and Greece provided it.
Well, I remember that, that 12th of March of 1947, and I thought that we were at the edge of the earth too. Because Truman went there to that joint session of Congress to ask for $400, $400 million worth of aid for Greece and Turkey, and he said, after all, it was a matter of life and death that all peoples had only one of two choices, that they were going to choose freedom or slavery. The world suddenly appeared through Manichaean lenses. And Truman said this, and I want you to remember that he's talking about the Greek regime. And he said, one way of life is based upon the will of the majority, and is distinguished by free institutions, representative government, free elections, guarantees of individual liberty, and freedom from political repression. The second way of life is based upon the will of a minority, forcibly imposed upon the majority. It relies on terror 